Hello, everyone. I'm Dean Gerber, ISTAT Board President and General Counsel at Valkyrie BTO Aviation, which forms part of the Blackstone Group. I'm happy to welcome you to this special ISTAT Learning Lab on the Ukrainian crisis and its impact on aviation. Those of you who attended our ISTAT Americas event in San Diego a few weeks back will remember that we held a similar session at that conference. It was one of the most well-attended conference events in ISTAT's history proving the unprecedented nature of these events and the significant impact that they're having on our industry. This session will cover some of the same ground, but will also include material events occurring subsequent to the Americas Conference. Cumulative impact of these series of events, however harmful to our industry and the world economies, do pale in comparison to the human tragedy unfolding in Ukraine. I know I speak for the ISTAT board and our larger ISTAT community in saying that our thoughts and prayers are with the Ukrainian people, and those around the world who are impacted. The ISTAT board and the ISTAT foundation have set up a matching campaign and hope to raise a total of $1 million to assist in the humanitarian relief efforts underway to provide needed aid to the Ukrainian people who are literally fighting for their lives to preserve their democracy. This is a call to arms moment and I hope you will go on the ISTAT website at ISTAT.org and help us in this endeavor. Your help is desperately needed. Moving on to our lab today, we've truly an outstanding panel who came together rather quickly to put this program together. We'll be joined by Rob Morris, who is head of consultancy at a set by Sirium. Rob, who is a frequent speaker at ISAT events, will lay the groundwork for the discussion and provide some overview of the scope of the problem, including the aircraft currently in Russia. I should mention that Rob stepped in just yesterday to fill Jeffrey Wool's slot, because Jeffrey had an unavoidable conflict that arose. So I'm grateful that he's participating. Rob will be followed by Emily Wicker, who's a partner at Clifford Chance. Emily will delve into the myriad sanctions that have been imposed to date on Russia and Russia's response. Chris Beers, who is Chief Legal Officer at Aircastle, will then take us through some of the insurance implications of these events and the likely litigation to ensue. Following all of that, time permitting, we'll have Q&A, so please feel free to submit your questions. With that, I'm going to start our program and turn it over to Rob Morris, who will set the stage for the discussion. Thank you, Dean. Um, good afternoon from a beautiful spring day in uh, in the UK in St Albans, just north of London. Um, let me share my screen um, so that I can set some context. Hopefully, you can now see that. Set some context for this learning lab. And uh, thank you, Dean, also for that late invitation to join. I really appreciate that. We've been trying to keep on top of this data for some two or three weeks now and just figure out what's going on. So a little bit of aviation data context in about five minutes to set the groundwork for where we are today. So <clears throat> um, just kind of disclaimer, you'll get the slide so you'll see that. Um, Russia, what, what is the context of Russia? How important is Russia to our commercial aviation sector? Russian airline traffic was around 4% of the global, uh, global total on average through 2019, back in those stable days that we now wish for again. Um, it did increase to a slightly higher share because the Russian domestic market recovered very rapidly, and that did lead to, uh, to a significant number of aircraft going on lease into Russia last year, which brings us to where we are. Um, that, was, that was something like 50-odd aircraft, used aircraft, went into Russia last year. Um, but it's about 4% of, of, of the global average is Russia in demand terms. What's happening in Russia? So actually right now, um, clearly after the invasion of Ukraine in late February, there's been a significant change in the commercial networks in Russia. Aircraft tracked flying on a daily basis have declined. And in fact, today, the international network is around one third or slightly less of what it were in 2019 in that benchmark. So just, just, just under 90 aircraft tracked flying on Russian international flights. There's a fundamental shutdown of the international network as Russia becomes isolated from uh, the rest of the world. The domestic network is also reducing, but, but less quickly. So still around 375 aircraft tracked last Friday, um, which was almost the same as the benchmark in, in March 2019, um, I suspect actually around Easter then. Um, but actually the domestic network declines, but not so quickly. Aircraft that, that, that are in Russia are still to some extent being used in Russia. I talked about what it was in demand terms. What is it for leasing? Because that's what we're really gonna be talking about in the next uh, 75 minutes or so. so. So again, Russia 
is the fourth largest international leasing market globally, with around 4% by value of the international lease portfolio placed in Russia. And I've defined international as, as lessors that are not domiciled in the particular market we're examining here. Um, around an indicative market value terms, $10 billion worth of assets, which we estimate were in Russia at the beginning of this crisis or were leased to Russian customers at the beginning of this crisis. And I will define those in a little bit more detail in this particular slide, which is a bit complex, but please bear with me. So there were 515 aircraft we estimate on lease to Russian customers as, as the conflict began. This is on actually on the 28th of March, or 28th of February, sorry, was when I first measured this data a few days after the conflict began. Um, as we dug, it, dug into these, we could see that around 40, it was 39 actually of these aircraft were outside of Russia at the start of the conflict. And based upon our tracking data and the, and the, the, the location of last landing, likely to be undergoing some lease returns. So 39 of these aircraft we think were probably in safe havens at the start of the of the conflict. Um, a further 39 aircraft we think appear to have been recovered from Russia after the start of the conflict, again, based upon our understanding of last known landing location, our tracking data, we can we can detect that those aircraft seem to have been seized in some location and and have flown to um, to other storage locations if if um, if that's been possible. Um, around 280 of them have flown within Russia within the past seven days and, and are thus, we think, defined as active. Uh, um, we've, we've, as, as Sirium, we, um, we typically define an aircraft as, as stored or parked when it has 30 days of continuous inactivity from tracking, but, but for times of crisis, we reduce that period and we think about seven days is the right period in Russia right now. Uh, so 157 have, have not flown in the past seven days, they're classified as parked, but 280, remain active and there's a bit of a churn in there. So it could it could be become um, more or less. You can see that of course, the majority of the fleet are 737, 800 A320. A large portion of the fleet are relatively young, A320 and 737 aircraft. So, um, so a significant element. And there are some 350 in there as well. Um, I didn't mention the bigger number. There are uh, at the start of this conflict again, there were 980 commercial aircraft jets and turboprops in airlines either stored or, or, or in service at the start of the of the conflict. There was an A350 that was delivered literally two days or so before the conflict. Um, of course, we're going to talk a lot, I think, uh, you know, my learning colleagues can talk a lot about the the uh, the, the re-registration in inverted commas uh, or deregistration from Bermuda and re-registration. Um, there were 745 of those 980 aircraft I mentioned that were registered in on the Bermudan register at the start of this crisis. There were a, a number of others registered in, in Ireland. Um, and obviously there were moves by the Bermudan uh, Civil Aviation Authority to, to uh, suspend the certificate of airworthiness. And again, colleagues on the panel will, will talk more in detail about that. They understand more than I do about that. Um, but, but our data is indicating to us that a number of those aircraft are being registered in inverted commas in, in Russia um, as a consequence of the move from the Russian government to permit that to potentially happen. Um, so 73 aircraft as of today, and there's always one day's data lag in here, but 73 aircraft we have confirmed as registered in inverted commas um, in, in, in Russia on the Russian register, plus a further 20 actually from Ireland to Russia in the context of the international lease uh, portfolio. 31 of those are owned or managed by non-Russian operating lessors today. And there's just the break, breakdown simply. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively slow process apparently, um, but it is a process that, that appears to be taking place. And I know the rest of the learning lab where I'll be listening keenly is going to talk about the, the implications of that and what it means um, for the portfolio. So, so that's a pretty quick skate through the context, just, just to summarize it really quickly. Um, Russia was around 4% of that global airline market through 2019. I mentioned that number 981 commercial aircraft, according to the Syrian fleet data, was in service with airlines in Russia or stored with airlines in Russia at the start of the conflict, of which 745 were registered in Bermuda and 73 of these have been in inverted commas re-registered in Russia today. 
it's around actually i didn't mention this because of course as well as the as well as the international operating lease market on my slide i showed the domestic it's around five percent of the overall global operating lease portfolio by value if we include the uh, the domestic lessors but it's around four percent of the international operating lease market uh, it's around it's actually around uh, uh, 4.7 and 4.3 so it's quite close 550 those aircraft leased to russian customers by international lessors <clears throat> i've run through how many of them we think are outside of Russia pre-conflict and post-conflict. Um, and actually, uh, the summary is that the 437 aircraft that remain in Russia today are going to be far harder, if indeed at all possible, to, to, to recover. They're potentially lost. And finally, of course, it does exclude any further Russian-owned aircraft, which may have been financed by international parties and could have debt against them, which could thus further inflate the, the potential loss. Um, so, so Dean, that was a really, really quick run through of, of some data um, that sets the context, you know, 4% to 5% is the number. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing now and uh, I'll hand back to Dean. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate uh, you setting the stage for us. Um, now we're going to be turning it over to Emily Wicker at, at Clifford Chance. I should point out, I think Clifford Chance has done a great job as a firm. Um, giving updates of, of sanctions that have occurred to date since the conflict began. I think to, to call the sanctions uh, swift and severe is probably an understatement, and that's saying a lot. Uh, but there's a lot to untangle. Um, the sanctions keep rolling out. There were new sanctions uh, and, and uh, comments made over the weekend, and Emily's going to try to help us untangle that web. Thanks, Dean. Um... I think the the key issues here are um, clearly that that sorry I'm having a little technical difficulty. I hope this is coming through okay. Um, the clear issues, as far as I'm concerned, are relating to the sanctions jurisdictions and the response of the Russians. But in addition to that, there is also, a, I think we need to level set and understand hey, where- hey, Emily, can I, can I interrupt for a moment? I don't see, we don't see the, uh, the, the presentation. Sorry, I'm having some, yeah, I'm trying to get back to that. Okay, sorry. Hold on. Let me let me try and work through this better. Okay, can you see that now? No. Why don't we let uh, Zach? Why don't you pull it up, and then we can you can just have him change the slides and Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, I think that should work now. Dean, can you see it? Yep, we got it. Okay, apologies for that. Um, so let's just go back to the beginning. In addition to all the sanctions, which we'll discuss here, I think it's important for everybody to, under, to understand which jurisdictions we're talking about and why. Um, we're hearing a lot of talk about Bermuda and the Cayman Islands and Ireland, and for everybody who's not necessarily involved in this every day, that may be a little bit puzzling. So the first thing to understand is from a US sanctions perspective, US sanctions are not particular to US persons or any in individual jurisdiction necessarily, they are multinational. So they relate to equipment that is imported, exported or re-exported that has the requisite amount of US source content, which does not necessarily mean only Boeing aircraft. So we could we could have aircraft that are, you know, Airbus aircraft with a critical mass, say, of GE engines that would be covered by the U.S. export control regulation. With respect to the EU, 
Um, as many people know, Ireland is certainly the, the worldwide hub of leasing activity. And even um, lessors whose ultimate parent company may be located outside of Ireland oftentimes use Ireland as the uh, nexus for their leasing activity. And as a result, the EU regulations on Ireland and Irish persons um, are clearly pointed and affect the aviation industry. Likewise, from a UK perspective, in addition to the obvious financing activity that's done in the UK, um, UK sanctions are also cover, they also cover overseas territories, including the Cayman Islands and Bermuda, both of which are jurisdictions that are often utilized in leasing structures. Now, with respect to Bermuda, as you've heard, um, there's an overwhelming number, in fact, the majority of, of Russian aircraft prior to, say, last week, were registered in Bermuda. And the reason for this is threefold. Number one, it's a safety concern. Number two is a concern about the ability of a lessor to exercise remedies. And number three, there's an efficiency perspective. So firstly, when the Russian aviation market sort of opened to the West, um, there was some concern among investors and lessors that the Russian airworthiness oversight was not as strong as some of the Western countries. And as a result, pursuant to the Chicago Convention, there's a protocol called Article 83 BIS, which would entitle two parties to the Chicago Convention to enter into a bilateral agreement where they agree to share the responsibilities of airworthiness and safety regulation. So the pertinent one in this situation is the Bermuda-Russia Article 83 BIS agreement, pursuant to which Russia is responsible for oversight of pilot and crew, and Bermuda is responsible for oversight of aircraft airworthiness and maintenance issues. With respect to the exercise of remedies, there was some concern that any asset that's um, on a public register in Russia could be, under Russian law, um, treated like real estate. So from the perspective of an investor or a lessor, that would make it much more difficult to um, exercise any default remedies. And again, this is pre-Cape Town Convention. And thirdly, Bermuda was a very efficient jurisdiction, one that is sophisticated, has a corporate services environment. And so as a general rule, um, aircraft just became registered in Russia, even though they were operated by Russian airlines. So that's sort of the, the background of all of this. Now, if we move to the actual sanctions, on February 24, Russia invaded Ukraine. And on February 25, the EU published their first set of sanctions that are targeted to the aviation industry. As you'll see here, it, it, it's prohibited to sell, supply, or transfer directly or indirectly aviation goods and technology to any natural person, legal person, entity, or body in Russia or for use in Russia. That for use in Russia language is key. It's quite broad. And going down the list here, not only was it the sale and supply, which it was clarified is um, supply does include leasing for this purpose. It was also prohibited to provide insurance and reinsurance with respect to these goods. It's prohibited to provide any kind of maintenance, overhaul, inspection, or other kind of modification uh, services. It's prohibited to provide any technical assistance, brokering, financial assistance um, with respect to any of the foregoing kinds of activities. And in the original EU legislation, the prohibition on sale, supply, thus leasing, and the prohibition on brokering and financing had a wind down period until the 20th of March. Um, but the other provisions, including with respect to insurance and reinsurance, did not. So that created some consternation for, for, the, for the community. Um, and then on March 5, there was a, a letter from the Director General of the EU in respect of the insurance issue, 
wherein it was clarified that the provision of insurance or reinsurance to leasing companies for aircraft and engines that would have been um, subject to the sanctions was permitted during the wind down period to March 28th. And then straight away after the EU sanctions were, in, were put in place, the UK sector sanctions came into place, which are largely parallel with two major differences. The UK sanctions are a bit more detailed, especially in connection with the financing activities that are prohibited. But you'll see here that they use somewhat broader language. In addition to the for use in Russia language, it is prohibited to directly or indirectly make goods available to a person connected with Russia. So that's even broader than a person in Russia or um, for use in Russia. So that, that's worth noting. The UK sanctions likewise did not have a wind down period. Um, it was just a direct full stop um, prohibition. And over the last couple of weeks, um, the EU clearly, or excuse me, the UK has clearly indicated that it will uh, follow the EU in terms of some of the March 28 um, wind down period. So we don't expect that there will be, um, you know, sort of an immediate uh, sanction event or a, a any accusation of violation of UK sanctions as a result of activity in, say, for example, leasing prior to the 28th. Um, I would also highlight here that, as many of you know, the UK is an insurance um, sort of epicenter. And so there was some concern about, you know, the, the again, the March 28 period for insurance and whether despite the EU's clarification that it, it extends to the 28th of March, whether the UK would take a different view. On March 28th, the UK Department of International Trade published a general license permitting the provision of insurance and reinsurance relating to aviation and related technology until the 28th of March for contracts that were concluded before that date. So. Um, really we're looking at a March 28th date for, for these things. If we look at the U.S. export controls, um, the U.S. has always had um, export controls over military technology and um, aviation and, and space-related technologies. In response to the invasion on the 24th of February, the U.S. Department of Commerce greatly expanded the export controls that were in place on Russia, and then even further expanded that on March 2nd to cover Belarus. So the U.S. export controls basically restrict the export, re-export, or sale or other, um, you know, transfer of aircraft parts, avionics, navigation equipment, or GPS, unless there is a license that's obtained from the government. So basically the U.S. has said, okay, you can't export any of this technology to Russia unless you get our approval. And at the same time, the U.S. simultaneously implemented a policy of denial of those licenses. So um, it, it's very difficult to see that there would be any real opportunity, certainly not for new aircraft, new parts, um, or even used items that were in the possession of somebody outside of Russia, it would be clearly prohibited to transfer them into Russia. Um, so if we, if we keep going, um, the U.S. also, I mean, I, I'm not going to cover all of the restrictions that various governments have placed over um, airspace and, you know, I think... Uh, Almost everybody in the EU, I think the whole of the EU has restricted Russian overflight and Russia has restricted overflight and the U.S. doesn't permit uh, Russian aircraft in U.S. airspace. That's a separate, a separate issue. Um, but from the sanctions perspective, it's, it's quite clear that um, 
the U.S. was not permitting any activity or any new assets uh, that have U.S. source content to go into Russia. The most interesting new development with respect to U.S. export controls was on Friday. On the 18th of March, again, the Department of Commerce, BIS, publicly identified by list of MSN over 100 commercial and private aircraft that flew to Russia in apparent violation of export controls. Um, in a press release on the, on the matter, the BIS noted that this puts the public on notice that providing any form of service to these aircraft will require authorization. So this is requiring people to seek license from the U.S. government. Without any such authorization, they've gone on to say that any person anywhere, so not just U.S. persons, any person, including persons within Russia, risk violating export controls and are subject to enforcement action. Uh, U.S. enforcement action includes civil penalties, financial pen penalties, and potential um, jail time as a result. Um, they, they noted that by publishing the list, the general public should be on notice that people cannot take any action with respect to these aircraft, which would include maintenance, repair, providing spare parts. Um, so it's important to think about that a little bit more broadly. Even if these aircraft, say for example, if one of them was in a maintenance facility outside of Russia, if it's on lease to a Russian carrier, it would be pro prohibited to do any of that maintenance on that aircraft. And so we need to be very careful about that. And so what the U.S. is doing is they're really encouraging people to seek licensing for this. And, and we should also note that this is not merely with respect to the 100 aircraft that were listed, but any aircraft that could be subject to sanction. Um, so for example, other aircraft that may be on lease to Russia or Russian airlines. Um, if you have a even an Airbus aircraft, for example, if it meets the, the threshold of the 25%, I think it's 25% of a US source content. So for example, if you're doing engine maintenance on a GE engine that is in a non-Russian country, that could be the subject of, of this precise prohibition, and you should be careful to make sure that you actually seek uh, permission to do that. So that's the newest development from the U.S. side. Um, coming now to Bermuda. So as a reaction to the EU sanctions, again, most lessors have an Irish connection even if it's with respect to individual directors that sit on an SPV board, um, there is obviously an, an EU sanction applicable to, to almost all of these, um, these Western leases. And so the, the lessors of those aircraft have effectively uh, terminated the leasing under the relevant leases and notified the Russian airlines of doing so. And as a result of that, in reaction to U.S. sanctions, the, or sorry, EU sanctions rather, um, Bermuda, who's responsible for oversight of airworthiness, has looked at the situation and understood that without having effective leasing requirements and without having, therefore, maintenance requirements, they became more and more wary of being able to have real oversight of the airworthiness certification of these aircraft. And so on the 12th of March, they effectively suspended all of the certificates of airworthiness of the aircraft operating under this Article 83 BIS agreement with Russia. So you have all these aircraft that were registered in Bermuda, that's suspended. Then the next, some of the timing of this is a little bit funny. So that was, the Bermuda response was official on the 12th, but it was clear that something was coming. And the Russian government um, in the meanwhile had um, told Russian airlines that they shouldn't be um, operating outside of Russia. So you saw the fleet coming back into Russia 
the Russian countermeasures, which we'll describe here, are legislation that is either currently being discussed or has been passed by the Russian government, specifically with respect to the aviation sector. So the first set of countermeasures that have been adopted as of March 11 allow the Russian government to make decisions regarding leasing, al altering the terms of leases, changing any sort of um, return or uh, make decisions actually with respect to the return of aircraft that are under lease with foreign legal entities. They've also implemented legislation, which I think may not have been finalized yet, but they have implemented registration directly with respect to airworthiness. So they have put in place or are on the verge of enacting into law special procedures that allow for what we would refer to as the additional registration of aircraft in Russia. And I think that's an important nuance. These aircraft are registered in Bermuda even though the Bermuda government has suspended the airworthiness certificates. What Russia has done is created a system whereby they would, in contravention of the Chicago Convention, re register, duly register, the same aircraft on the Russian aircraft registry. And this is, there's legislation in place that has um, sort of grandfathered airworthiness that had been effective prior to the Bermuda suspension into Russian law, at least through September of 2022. In addition, um, Russia has passed another law, uh, effective March 14th, that will prohibit Russian insurers from entering into any agreements with insurers or reinsurers or brokers that are located in a so-called unfriendly jurisdiction. And it will also limit the transfer of funds to any Western, essentially, insurers or reinsurers. Um, so they, they have a provision that a license could be obtained, but I think we all understand that that's unlikely to occur. So the Russian government has basically said that with respect to you know, primary insurance, in favor of Russian airlines, that will not be, um, the, the reinsurers outside of Russia won't really have any benefit of that. And then the final notice um, in terms of Russian countermeasures has been that the Russian Federation has suspended the Article 83 BIS agreement between Russia and Bermuda. So I think there are several questions which have arisen from this that we can talk about in greater detail later, but there's obviously um, a contravention of the Chicago Convention as a result of the dual registration. There's also um, a contravention of the Cape Town Convention because the government of Russia is not honoring the rights of lessors who are seeking to exercise remedies under leases which have breaches. Um, and the problem with all of this is that there really isn't an enforcement mechanism available to the individual lessors. Enforcement of um, international treaties is always done at the state, the national level. And so we really do have an international situation that has yet to be determined in terms of how it will be worked out. So that's the state of the current uh, sanctions and relevant countermeasures at the time. And I will turn it back over to Dean. Thanks, Emily. I know uh, that a lot of you have, have questions on a lot of this, and, and we will try to get to them um, at the end of the session, time permitting, which I think we'll have. So now I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who's going to walk through kind of some of the insurance related issues, which are uh, equally as thorny. And um, I think it's important to remember generally that uh, at this point, in the game, we've got a lot of questions, but we don't have a lot of answers. And um, as Emily points out, you know, these sanctions are, are deep and difficult and thorough, uh, and they cover a lot of ground. It'd be tough for us to uh, fully understand the implications of them 
uh, presently. We just have to see how this all plays out. Similar with the insurance issues, which are equally, if not more thorny. And I'll pass it over to Chris. Yeah, if you, if you thought sanctions make your head hurt, wait till we get into insurance. Um, as Dean mentioned, we don't have a lot of time here. We It's gonna to be tough to just scratch the surface, uh, but we would like to get to Q&A if possible. So let me just start off with a little uh, quick disclaimer. Uh, notwithstanding my role as the chief legal officer of Aircastle, nothing that I'm gonna talk about today is should be attributed to, to Aircastle. And it's also not legal advice. If you want legal advice, talk to a real lawyer like, uh, like Emily. Um, I, I'm just, what I'm going to try to do here is just kind of walk through in, in layman's terms, or as Henry Hobson used to call it, farmer talk, you know, what the, pers what the landscape is from a lessor, lessor perspective, what we don't, what we know, what we don't know. Um, we're not going to try to handicap outcomes. Um, there are people in the community that have a pretty favorable view on how this could turn out and they may be right. And let's hope they're right. Um, there are others in the industry that may have a more guarded or pessimistic view, and let's hope they're wrong. But right now, there's there's so much that we don't know that let's not try to get out a crystal ball and predict how this is going to come out, because whatever people try to predict, it will be wrong. Um, this is an evolving landscape. So um, let's see how all this uh, can play out, and I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Um, I did that. I think I shared the wrong screen. Did I get Dean, am I, do you're, I have the right screen? You're good, yep. I'm good, okay, good. Well, I'm seeing something totally different here, but that's fine. Um, so uh, let's go to the, the first page. Uh, Emily, you know, set this up a little bit on the, on the Russia response, um, but, you know, I like to think about it. So what's Putin's plan? Um, this, this all got set in motion once the tanks rolled across the border of the Ukraine and sanctions started to be issued. Um, what was the Russian government, what were airlines going to do about returning these aircraft? As Rob showed in some of his materials, the Russian civil aviation fleet is largely Western and largely leased. Um, and if airlines return aircraft or the government lets it happen, they don't have a civil aviation fleet. Um, so, you know, keeping a close eye on what we're going to be pro probable responses um, and, and Emily has gone over a lot of the actions that the Russian government has taken to date. There is a Russian decree in circulation and legislation has been um, passed to, to allow it to be enacted. Don't know whether it will be enacted or when, but interestingly, it basically says, look, leases continue. You know, we're gonna ignore sanctions and actually what the leases say, but the leases will continue. There'll be payments in rubles. Um, I, you know, I don't think anybody will be able to actually accept them, assuming they even wanted to. Um, and that maintenance, insurance, and registration were going to be done in Russia. And by the way, if you want to get your aircraft returned early, you're going to need to get uh, you're going to need to get permission for that. Um, let's see how that comes out. Um, and you know, insurers and others will be taking a close look at this next step. And you know, is this a confiscation? Has a confiscation already happened? We'll kind of get into that. Um, asset recovery. Look, this is something that that the minute the sanctions got announced, lessors um, looked at saying, how do I get my aircraft out of there? I know that there's a wind down period for leasing. I don't want to wait until March 28th. I think in some ways, thankfully, the, the EU uh, sanctions sanctioned insurance from the outset. So it's like, well, wait a second, you don't have insurance. You got to ground my aircraft. You've got to return it. And I think there's have been some small success stories about that. Um, but now has the window closed. The airlines got wised up pretty quickly not to fly leased aircraft, you know, to jurisdictions where they could potentially be recovered. Um, and the government also started, you know, make, passing laws and making steps to make that a little bit more difficult. But where we are now, will some aircraft still be returned? I hope so. Um, you know, does, does the Russian civil aviation fleet need all these aircraft types? It will probably be a largely domestic operation. You know, what aircraft types will they in practice be able to maintain uh, without the benefit of, of the OEMs? You would just think logically that newer tech aircraft may, may be harder and more difficult to retain. So maybe those could come back or maybe they'll get held as hostages. We don't know. Uh, the other thing is eventually when aircraft do come back, 
there's going to be a black hole in the records. These aircraft will have dual registration under you know what standards they've been maintained. And, and how does how does a lessor or the industry go in and fill that gap for the period that these aircraft were operated and maintained in Russia? These are just some practical considerations that we'll have to work through. But asset recovery, I'm sure, will continue after March 28th. It's hard to see how sanctions would prohibit a lessor from trying to still recover its assets and comply with sanctions. So um, I think that work will continue. Insurance, we're going to get into in a sec. A couple of things we're just not going to spend a lot of time on here. I will touch on, you know, you have cross-border financial instruments, and we haven't discussed at all all the financial sanctions, um, but they do have an implication on flow of funds, instruments that are out there, including letters of credit that uh, a lot of the uh, leasing community rely on. You had uh, letters of credit that were issued by Russian banks that would typically be confirmed by Western banks, um, and, you know, will banks you know try to use sanctions avoiding paying those claims and also banks started introducing um into their confirming letters of credit that they don't have to pay if sanctions prohibited so what does that really mean for the future of letters of credit as a substitute for cash and will banks even want to be in the this business it's a pretty low margin business for them so we'll keep an eye on that obviously oil and fuel prices there are supply chain issues that will deal with you know maintenance and production more broadly across the aviation sec sector. People are thinking about if Russia can do this, what are other rogue states going to do? Um, I won't name any, but they're pretty obvious. Um, obviously, impact on traffic um, uh, globally and uh, in foreign exchange. But I, I will put a little uh, optimistic note on here. This industry has been through the abyss before many times. Um, and when people say, oh, it's never going to recover because business travel, there's conference calls or there's Zoom calls or there's the internet. This industry has always been very resilient at recovery. So um, I, I, I think don't, don't bet against it. Uh, it will recover. We will pass through this crisis and um, people are going to want to travel. So let's, let's take that as a little nugget of positive information. So let me go to the next slide. I'm going to try to tick on this really quickly. Some of you may be familiar with this, which is just as we as we do a little primer on um, aviation insurance, kind of falls into two basic categories. You have your main policy, and this is for airlines, lessors, or whatever. They all basically would follow the same structure. Your main policy covers hull damage or loss to the aircraft, which the policy won't actually say this, but in practice, it in would include theft or conversion. I think it's constructive total loss, and people that are in the insurance world are probably rolling their eyes right now but um your whole coverage would, would include you know theft of the of the aircraft uh and then you have liability cover uh which would be third party bodily injury and, and and third party property damage but your main policy doesn't cover losses due to war war terrorism hijacking requisition and confiscation and so you get separate coverage for that and that's called your war cover and that follows the main policy there's hull war and an excess liability on war. The one thing that we'll, I'll just note here is that those policies typically would have cancellation clauses. You know, people have to read their own policies and they may say different things, but I think it's pretty standard that those coverages would be cancelable on seven days notice. We saw this after 9-11. Um, and um, right after the sanctions were um, came into effect, you started seeing insurers given seven-day notice um excluding Russia and other territories um from their from their war cover and we'll get to that in a sec so and sorry for going through this pretty quickly but we just don't have a lot of time um so how does how does aviation insurance work in Russia and this would be your typical structure for a Russian lease um as you may well be aware, leasing companies principally rely when they put an aircraft on leases on the airline's insurance. Um, so in the case of Russia, the airline would typically get its insurance in the Russian market. Um, that doesn't give lessors a whole lot of comfort. Um, so then they'll go reinsure that risk in Western UK, EU markets uh, for about 95% of the value, about 5% or so would be retained in Russia. And then lessors would look at that and say, okay, that's great, but I really don't want to have to go to Russia. I want the ability to access the reinsurance directly. 
And there'll be things like cut through clauses or reinsurance assignments that do provide direct access uh, and have in the past that may not be so clear if we get involved in, in litigation. I'll, I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, and then some lessors, um, I would say not all, uh, but some lessors also purchased their own policy. Um, and that would cover Hull and War in kind of two scenarios. One, contingent insurance. So that's when your aircraft are on lease. Your contingent insurance would cover you if the primary cover doesn't pay out. Um, and then your possessed cover is when you have an aircraft that's off lease. Obviously, you can't rely on airline insurance. Um, so when it's off lease or in the course of repossession, you can typically get it moved over to your to your possessed cover. They basically cover the same thing. Uh, it covers you know haul liability and uh, and, and your cover. So, what are the kind of threshold insurance consideration? And look, you can pick down into this, and this will get you know the battle will be won and lost in the weeds. Um, in you know technical terms, what policies say and what have you. But just from a high level, what are the potential considerations? Well, one, like what's what's the total value of the exposure, the you know the the exposure of the insurance and the potential pot of of recovery. As Rob had noted uh, in his estimate, there was about you know ten billion dollars worth of Western aircraft by market value on um, on lease into Russia. Now your insured values you know may be higher. Market values may be depressed a little bit for aircraft types after after COVID. So your insured values may be higher. But even if you take the total of the insured values um, of all the aircraft that were on lease in Russia, the insurance limits, insurance have limits and the insurance limits may be lower than that. So that would be a combination of adding up all of the airline insurance exposure and the lessor insurance exposure and tally it up. And I, you know, that that's not something you can go into a database and find out. Um, but that will be, you know, what's the potential total cost source of recovery there? And actually, are the um, insurers able to pay that? This is a really big claim, just generally for insurance, but particularly for aviation. Um, let's just say safely, it's in the many, many billions of dollars. And you know how how wide is that? How many insurers does this fall on? And it there are players that play in the in the aviation market and even the war risk market. We've talked about in, in prior in San Diego that the war risk market pretty narrow group of insurers that actually have a specialized and play in that area. But that doesn't mean they've retained all the risk. Um, this risk gets spread out in the industry through reinsurance. So those primary insurers will go out and reinsurance and 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 basically mitigate and shift some of the risk to the reinsurers. And those reinsurers will do the same. It's called retrocession. I learned a new word the other day. Um, so there's reinsurance of reinsurance. And then there's also probably derivative products, you know, that get that get sold. And this may be like, you know, what happened with AIG is nobody really knew how deep and far their exposure went until they started picking it apart. But safe to say, there are a lot of people that have that have a stake here, and I think that's good uh, that the risk that the risk is spread. Um, is a bailout likely potential? Maybe. I mean, the government's imposed sanctions, which are causing losses to insurers and to and to leasing companies, and maybe the government can you know will will step in and help bail out insurers and help keep that vibrant. Um, sanctions. So, I, you know, the sanctions considerations on insurance are, will sanctions limit the insurer's ability to pay? Will they use it as a defense to say, I, hey, I'd love to pay you, but I can't because of sanctions. Um, and then also on insurance, is insurance, you know, available for non-Russian airlines operating into Russia? As Emily talked about, there's, uh, you know, the, the sanctions use this lang language for use in Russia, and that has created some confusion about, um, whether after the sanctions wind down, will non-Russian airlines be able to operate into Russia um, and, and will they have access to insurance in the EU and the UK markets? And people are seeking some clarifications on that, but those are some real practical insurance considerations. And then we get down to the heart of the matter. If the aircraft doesn't come back, it's either stolen or it's confiscated. Which is it? Well, that'll get, that'll get litigated. Um, um, and um, 
you know, when, when did the loss occur? You know, the insurance industry is really good at processing your typical claims. It's kind of a well-oiled machine. An aircraft, you know, has some damage. Claims get filed. Uh, they get processed. Reinsurers come in and say, sure, we're dealing with it. This is unlike anything else we've seen. And it's also, you know, when did the loss occur? It's not like the accident occurred on this date or on that date. The government grabbed the aircraft and started flying around military equipment. Um, you know, there's, did it start the, the the day the tanks rolled in? Did it start some sometime later than that? When did the loss occur? These things will all have to get decided and will have a real bearing on insurance. These notices of cancellation I mentioned earlier that it, were issued under the war policy, are they valid? Um, you know, the way to think about it is if you have a tsunami, you know, on the horizon coming towards the beach town, the insurers can't just come up and, uh, and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not covering this. And obviously it depends on policies and where this is all being held. So let's keep that, um, let, let's keep that all in mind. Um, but you know, were those notices of cancellation valid? And, um, and if they were valid, when did the loss occur before or after that? So the, these, are the, these are the myriad of issues that are gonna get this resolved and they're big dollars. Um, so how does it get resolved? Big dollars, myriad of issues, litigation probably, um, if so, where? Um, so you have policies that are have different governing laws. I think I, the latest count that I'm aware of, and there's probably more, obviously you've got England because of the London market. You've got New York, you've got Dublin, there's California um, and Florida, and there may be others. Um, and what can happen then is you can have inconsistent results that this, this is uncoordinated um, litigation in different jurisdictions and one you know one court may decide in one jurisdiction that oh the loss occurred on this date and and, and you can get an inconsistent result somewhere else bottom line it's going to take a long time for those to get settled out or to resolved but maybe it gets settled out let's hope so let's hope that the insurance industry and the insureds maybe governments can all come together and figure out a way to make everybody whole uh, but there's a lot of people at the seat on the table as i mentioned the insurance risk does get spread pretty broadly in the insurance market through a reinsurance and retrocession, and some of those parties may have rights to sign off on settlements. So, so we'll see. Uh, as Dean said, a lot of questions, not a lot of answers yet. But you know, we start to chip away um, and, uh, and and narrow this down. And there are some potential knock-on impacts on aviation. Um, when there's large losses, what happens? People exit the market and prices go up. Um, so, you know, it, expect there to be some pretty difficult renewals coming up over the next 12 months or later. Um, and then also what happens to war cover? You know, we saw private insurers after 9-11 exit the market um, because of the potential for large claims on the war uh, hull cover. Um, is that market, you know, will people seek to exit that market? And a lot of work was done after 9-11 um, in trying to come up with a, a government-backed alternative uh, for, for war risk. And I think, you know, blow the papers off and, and, and dust it off, we may need it. Hopefully we don't. But the takeaway, we're bracing for a protracted battle, but let's hope we don't have one. Um, and then the last thing is, this is going to be a long game. You're shifting, you know, how do we transition from where we are right now? You know, three or four weeks ago when... Putin invaded and we just had the sanctions. There was a lot of uncertainty. It was crisis mode um, and starting to identify what were the issues? How do people get aircraft back? Um, I think we've made as an industry a lot of progress since then. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, asset recovery is still at the top of the charts. I don't see that slowing down. Hopefully sanctions don't get in the way after March 28th of um, lessors getting back their aircraft, engines, obviously you need records, aircraft and engines don't do a hell of a lot of good without records. Um, the registration issues, um, you're seeing this shift of, as Rob pointed out, and Emily said that the aircraft are being re-registered in, in Russia, not re-registered, dual registered in Russia. Um, and then the impact of the sanctions on the practical impacts of asset recovery. The U.S. sanctions on BIS, does that make it difficult to actually get work done on aircraft in order to enable them to be flown out? So those, those things will have to get picked at. Um, 
a lot of work still being done on clarifications on sanctions and keeping an eye on the Russian response, as we talked about insurance, um, prepping for claims, and then accessing reinsurance. Reinsurance has always worked pretty well, um, but uh, the industry doesn't have typically direct visibility onto insurance policies that rely on something called AVN 67, but you don't see the policies and you don't necessarily need to see who all the insurers are. Um, and that may be playing out here um, in, in something that may make it a little bit more difficult. I, I, we get there, I think, um, but it may make it a little bit more difficult to understand actually what the details of the policy are and, and who are the insurers that we're seeking to make claims against. And then we kind of get into the midterm game, asset preservations, records, maintenance, continued recovery. Will there be a walk back on sanctions? We saw that a little bit um, in uh, with the Crimea. Um, that's obviously going to depend on what happens on the ground. Um, so who knows how that comes out. And then insurance, we touched on cost capacity, this plan B for war risk. And then future, you know, this, there's some long tail events for this, some of which may be good. Does this finally, is this the precipitating event that gets to digitization of records? So you don't have to worry about getting dirty fingerprint records or getting boxes of records. They're all accessible on the web. Um, and if you've got your, your, your assets, your engines and your airframe, you, you know, you already have the records. Uh, and then cross-border acceptance of records. That's something I know that the AWG has been working on for a long time. Um, recovering losses will be a long game. Recovering from insurance, looking to governments. There's also some bilateral investment treaties. There may be other sources. Um, and then how does this impact rule of law? You know, treaties um, that, uh, you know, Cape Town, Chicago Convention, Russia is, Russia has just been ignoring this, but I think there are rational minds in, in Russia that just say, if you just start ignoring treaties and stealing everybody's aircraft, what's going to happen when you come out the other side? Um, and one thing that somebody raised the other day, and I thought it was pretty smart, was, you know, if sanctions are going to be the we weapon of the future, you know, is there some work that industry can do ahead of time to actually, you know, have some clarity on sanctions and how it works? So it's not that you have this, you know, these very broad sanctions that come out and then there's a whole lot of uncertainty. They're actually, you kind of pre-wire this stuff ahead of time. Um, but, you know, there's, and the takeaway box here is really important. There's a lot of alignment in the industry among OEMs, lessors, uh, and others, and we need a, alignment over a long period of time. Um, the AWG is working on this, the AL, ALI, uh, ICAO, a, and others. Um, so with that, uh, I think we're going to turn it over to Q&A. So Dean, um, I'll bring you back on. Thank you, Chris. That was great. And I'd like to bring the entire panel back because uh, we're going to do a bit of a round robin Q&A. We've got about uh, 15 minutes left and, and there are a good number of questions out there. Um, the first one I'd like to touch on, and this uh, not surprising, Emily, a lot of the questions have to do with uh, the, the sanctions. Um, actually, I hadn't given this thought, but, but uh, one of the uh, folks had provided a question that says, um, there are still aircraft flying into Russia from what we'll call neutral countries. Uh, this reminds me of the old Cuba issue we used to face in the United States with OFAC, sanctions that are so overly broad that it made you wonder if you had any interest in an aircraft financed or leased into a airline that operates into that, into Cuba. Uh, and it took us a long time to kind of come to um, where we are today. Uh, what do you see the current issue is with uh, leasing an aircraft to a airline based in, call it neutral country, and that aircraft operates into Russia? What's your view on that? Right. Well, there are two questions there. One, whether or not that's a violation of EU sanctions, which prohibit specifically supply and leasing of aircraft for use in Russia. So that's something that uh, I think Chris alluded to this. Parties are seeking clarification from the Director General of the EU uh, with respect to what for use in Russia means and if that would cover, for example, regularly scheduled commercial service in and out of country. Um, that's something that we can, that, that's one you know, aspect that needs to be considered. The other aspect that needs to be considered again is the US sanction and whether or not the Department of Commerce and the BIS would take the view that that would be re-export or export and re-export of US source content 
in violation of the EAR? So there are two questions. I think the, the U.S. doesn't specifically prohibit leasing. So that's not the issue. The U.S. sanctions prohibit the supply of the relevant goods. And so um, supply is a bad term, actually, in this context. It, it, it's the export and re-export, right? So there's a question about if, if somebody went to the U.S. government for a license, um, there is a policy of denial. So maybe that's something people haven't done yet. Um, I don't think, it, to my knowledge, nobody's taken any action in that regard. But from the EU perspective, people are um, seeking a clarification for this exact purpose. Yeah, I think obviously any well-drafted lease will have prohibitions from any lessee operating into jurisdictions that are prohibited. Right. But in this case, it's really clear as mud. And so um, I Well, and say, every lease is different. I mean, I think yeah. the, de the definition of sanctions in any lease could be broad enough to kind of obviously take this into account or potentially not. I mean, there are some sanction definitions I've seen before, which really only look at, you know, Iran, North Korea, the, the you know, broad specter sanctions on specific nations. Um, so again, this is not something that you can say with 100% certainty is the same with respect to every lease. Okay, let's, let's move on. A former ISTAD board president who's prone to asking uh, probing questions uh, asks, um, talking about the issue of impairment of assets in Russia. And, and obviously there's no answer anyone can give with any certainty today, but uh, there is a question that if you have um, an aircraft that's sitting on the ground in Russia, how do appraisers, lessors think about putting a value on that asset? And I know Chris probably gonna keep his mouth shut on this, obvious reasons. So I'll look to Rob to um, provide his general view, kind of what you all are doing currently and um, how do you see this progressing? Yeah, thanks, Dean. Uh, that's a good question and a question that we've heard a few times already and I'm sure we'll hear more and more as this goes on. Um, and the answer is we're starting to think about it, but we don't have an answer yet. So it's almost definitional. If you think about it, you know, ISTAT defines current market value, current market value, the, the the value the asset would realize if sold in today's market between a willing buyer and a willing seller, no encumbrance of reasonable marketing time, blah, 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 all those definitions. Um, and and it, seems, it seems to me like the definition can't be met by these assets. So that means there probably needs to be another value. But at right now, we've never, I mean, I don't think, I've only been at the Senate for 10 years, but I don't think we've ever adjusted a value for jurisdiction issue. We might adjust the value for condition or we might adjust the value for an encumbrance or we might adjust the value for um, some other reason, but not for jurisdiction. So we've got to think that one through yet and we've not got there yet. So at the moment, the current market value is the current market value. We're making that kind of, oh, by the way, we also we also assume the aircraft is airworthy. <laughs> is it airworthy today? I mean, there's all those things to consider we've, that have been discussed by by the panel in the, in the last few uh, last minutes. So I think, for now, we don't have an answer. We're considering it. Um, I don't know, different appraisers might think about it differently, but but as said by Sirium for now, we don't have an answer to do those aircraft have a different value to an asset that is in a jurisdiction where it is free to trade. Okay. I don't know, Chris, do you have anything to add or I, just to move I, on? No, I, I, the only thing I'll say, it's, it's something I think all the lessors are, are thinking about. Um, yeah. It's another thing so, we, don't, we don't have answers to, but we're going so to have let, let's. Let's talk a bit about um, lessor and lender reaction because we haven't really gotten to the specifics. We talk about canceling leases, terminating leases, uh, putting leases in default and whatnot. Um, how has the market generally reacted? You know, the, the sanctions uh, impact lenders as well, as we know. Uh, so if you're a EU-based lender and your uh, lessee under a finance lease is in Russia, uh, their implications and you need to effectively get out of that financing by the end of March. So how have we seen uh, lenders and lessors, particularly lenders, who really haven't touched on them, kind of address that point and you know, what can they do? I'll throw it to Emily first. Sure. Well, the predominant financing of these aircraft is done via the lessor. So it's rare to see a direct loan to a Russian carrier. If it's done, it's done via finance lease and that would be treated sort of in the same way. They would be you know, terminating the finance lease 
and demanding return. In respect of um, sort of the lessor financings, if the lessor takes steps to terminate the leasing, then the view is generally speaking that the financier would not be in violation of any sanctions as a result of that, so long as the nexus to, to the Russian carrier is, is terminated and the lessor has taken reasonable steps to, to do that. Um, what we are seeing, though, of interest is um, the impact that this has had in trading on pooled vehicles. So if you look at what people refer to as aircraft ABS transactions, there are a number of them that have, you know, some of them quite a, a, a high level of, of Russian uh, carriers in their portfolios. And so there's been um, some distress in that market. And I think you've seen people like KBRA put out statements about downgrades of certain portfolios. And quite honestly, I think this whole situation has had quite a chilling effect on that market as a whole. We're hearing that several deals which had been in the market are on hold um, because of the uncertainty. And it's twofold. It's the uncertainty with respect to the Russian carriers themselves, but also the impact on, say, for example, rising fuel costs on a, you know, a Delta or United. This, this is going to affect much broader financing markets. So right now, I think the uncertainty in the financing markets is just kind of frozen things a bit. I don't know, Chris, sir, do you have anything else to add to that? Okay. Not, so let's, not really. Not good. Actually, one interesting question we haven't talked about as well, and, and Rob, you may have some insight to that, because um, there was a question regarding engine leasing and exposure of lessors on the engine leasing side, obviously tougher to track engines. Um, and so do we have any idea kind of the scope and size of, of the problem there? To, to be honest, Dean, no. Because of that point you make, it's very difficult to track. I mean, aircraft are easy to track. They have registrations on the side, albeit <laughs> perhaps not the right registrations now, but but engines much tougher to track. And, you know, we don't even know, in fact, when those assets are operating in Russia, whether the titled engines are installed on the airframes anyway, whether there's been an element of swapping. So to, to be honest with you, I don't think we were able to, to scale the size of the issue with respect to the engine leasing market there. Um, I, I will one point to make though a, lot, a large number of the wide body aircraft that are in Russia are going to be in total care package and, and the support for those aircraft those engines will will be have been withdrawn and these increasingly complex assets um, which are somewhat temperamental like our own like our own IT often require support so it's we see a large number of these aircraft or engines becoming technically unserviceable relatively quickly and potentially with the Russian infrastructure not having the ability to fix them. So, you know, we do see the impact of the sanction, which is meant to be, we bring the Russian economy to a halt, perhaps starting to buy it a bit more quickly. So it's not quite the right answer, same answer to the question, but I think we do see some, some difficult times ahead for the carriers that are potentially now using these aircraft in contravention of the sanctions we talked about. Okay, that's um, another question uh, regarding the U EU and UK sanctions apply to uh, EU and UK uh, residents, but not uh, effectively residents in other countries. Uh, but the US sanctions tend to have a more global effect. And I'm, Emily, do you wanna just touch on that? Because uh, this, this is typical, not just of these specific sanctions, but OFAC sure. and you know, the, uh, the IS sanctions General. Yeah, the, the, the United States view on sanctions, kind of like their view on securities law, is that it's without borders. So the United States takes the view that they sanction the export of U.S. goods and services or the re-export, which is where this gets a little bit more interesting in the context of an aircraft. Um, so th that applies globally without regard to who's doing the activity. It's the thing. So the thing is U.S. source then it's prohibited. Um, the EU and UK sanctions prohibit residents of those specific jurisdictions from taking certain activity. So they're sort of opposite of one another. So the EU and UK sanctions prohibit EU and UK persons, individuals, corporate entities from, for example, leasing or financing aircraft in this exact situation. The U.S. sanctions don't prohibit leasing per se. They don't pro prohibit 
I won't get into the SWIFT situation, but they, they don't prohibit leasing aircraft or financing aircraft per se, but they do prohibit any person globally from exporting or re-exporting into Russia certain goods that are U.S. source goods. And just, just on that, you know, the, the term export, uh, we may think about it in layman's terms, is not the way the U.S. thinks about yeah. it. So if you have, if you have a non-Russian carrier, um, take a Middle Eastern carrier that flies an aircraft that has U.S. content, take a Boeing aircraft, into Moscow, that's an export. That would be prohibited. Now, there's something called temporary sojourn rules that would allow these airlines to fly in and come back out. Um, but it's this extraterritorial reach that it really these U.S. sanctions touch just about everybody. If there's U.S. content on those aircraft, yeah. you better understand, you know, what your airlines are doing with those aircraft. Because uh, if they fly that aircraft in and they leave them there for a certain period of time, again, talk to a real lawyer, an expert on that, um, you may have a problem. <laughs> right. Even though you'd say, well, it's you know, a Middle Eastern carrier, it should be a big deal. Um, so I think that's something that people need to pay a really close attention to. And it would be doubly important if, for example, in, in your hypothetical, if that aircraft was, say, leased by an Irish lessor to the, <laughs> to the carrier, um, and it was, you know, let's make it an easy one, a 747 that, that operates to Moscow, then you would have the situation where both the EU and U.S. sanctions could apply. That's right. And it gets back to that for use in Russia. And hopefully right. by March 28th, we'll have some clarity about, you know, whether the EU sanctions basically apply to, you know, any aircraft non-Russian flying into Russia, as long as it's, it, and look, a lot of leasing companies lease through Ireland. So it touches touches a lot in the community, not necessarily everybody, but. That's an interesting point. Do we expect more clarity coming out before 28 March? I don't expect anything, but I hope for it. Okay. <laughs> Actually, okay. I, they, that being said, you know, ALI has probably been, you know, uh, and AWG have been on the forefront of this. And I think they've, they, they have gotten some pretty good feedback and communications with uh, DG Mobility on the, on the EU side and also on the, on the UK side. I, I, I think that regulators are trying to do something that, you know, come up with rules that make sense and they're, you know, are not unduly punitive. Um, but whether or not they intended the sanctions to prevent, you know, more flights going into Russia, even for non, I, that, that will have to ask the regulators. But you'd like to at least know <laughs> whether they can go and whether they have insurance. Yeah. Well, it raises an interesting point. Uh, one of the questions gets to this notion of the, the legislation, as I understand it, that's come out of Russia basically says, you know, we will return your aircraft at the end of the lease with permission. And um, it's, uh, it's unclear what that means. Or if that means you're just never going to get it back because you're never going to get permission. Um, but having said that, uh, with, and this was a point raised earlier, if you've got aircraft that are now operating in Russia with a Russian C of A, with Russian oversight, with presumably non-OEM parts that are going into the aircraft, whether they're they may be cannibalizing other aircraft, or they may just be using alternative parts uh, that are not uh, certified in the sense that we know it. Um, at some point, if given the option of getting that aircraft back, would you take it? Or would you just rely on the fact that um, insurance is potentially available and you'd fight that fight? You might have to take it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, and, and, and that gets into the, the insured. When, the, when did the loss occur? And is it basically, you know, are the insurers subrogated to that? But it's, it's, it's a real issue that with this black hole that you may have on, on, on maintenance and how does that get recreated? And, you know, people are thinking about this, you know, short term and, and even, even over the long term. And that, that point that came up in the question about the return of the aircraft, that's that draft Russian decree that's around that you need permission to renew, to, uh, move an aircraft early or to terminate and return an aircraft early, but it allows, I don't think it compels, it allows the airlines to return the aircraft at lease expert. They still may not. Um, and that, you know, that just raises a whole host of, of practical issues from the insurance side, maintenance, valuation. And what from a contractual, sorry, Chris, I was going to say from a contractual perspective, you might clearly have a lease violation if 
for example, the aircraft is returned at the, even if it's returned at the proper or the agreed uh, termination date of the lease, you might have an aircraft that does not meet the return conditions. And as a result, in the ordinary course, you would have some sort of payment coming to the lessor, but query whether or not a Russian airline will be able to even pay in dollars or euro or whatever other currency that, that money. Um, so it gets, it gets pretty ugly. Yeah, and, I, and I think it plays further from our perspective into that, that point about return condition anyway. So, you know, are they able to meet the return condition given that the period between the apparent seizure and the return of the aircraft, the aircraft's been maintained by a non-authorized body. So how do we then as appraisers assess the adjusted value of that asset given, you know, Chris talked about the holes in the records. We don't, we don't, don't trust those records. We don't know that the authorized parts have been used. We don't, we can't verify even the utilization actually. Well, can because of tracking, but we can't actually verify. It. So, so the, the value of that asset of return is potentially going to be significantly impaired by the period between the seizure and return. Um, and that's going to become an issue for a long time. Yeah. Well, listen, a lot of questions as we know, as we know, and not a lot of answers, but we've come to the end of our program. Apologies. We couldn't get to all the, the questions in the Q of A, uh, but I know feel free to reach out to us. Um, happy to answer to the extent we can. I want to thank uh, the panelists uh, for this terrific discussion, it's really important. We're hoping to do more of this because I know at this stage, uh, there's just a lot of unknowns. So I wanna thank you all, uh, appreciate uh, everyone joining and we hope to see you again on another Learning Lab. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks to the panelists, good discussion. Thank you.